So we're going to be going through the book of Ezra um, for the next two weeks. And um, so I'm privileged um, to be able to uh, look into it, not just, I actually feel pretty good tonight. Um, I, I mean, just spending time with the Lord and going through this book, I learned some new things. And so that always gets me pumped. And uh, so I actually don't really care if you get much out of it. I got a lot of it. I mean, I'm up here for me at this point. So. Um, but I, I, I realize I'm feeling good because someone prayed for me. So I don't know who you are, but thank you. And if it goes well, it's definitely... Uh, your, uh, if it doesn't go well, don't worry about that. The Lord just wants to keep me humble. That's, he always wants to keep me humble. So if it doesn't go well, it's not your fault. Your prayers really made a difference. Um, so, uh, actually, uh, traditionally, actually, Ezra and Nehemiah are one book. So it's actually called Ezra and Nehemiah. And so within these two books, there's actually three stories, there's uh, the beginning story of Zerubbabel and the building of the temple, and then Ezra and the uh, revamping of the whole system, of trying to reinstate the whole system. And then Nehemiah, we know, built the wall around Jerusalem because there's, uh, and there's amazing story in, in all of it. But the thing that I wanted to point out is that with each story, there's amazing success, and then there's kind of a downer at the end of each one. And... Um, we're going to look at what was going. And so I'm going to actually start out with a, a big picture, like maybe a 10,000 foot elevation view of what the storyline is about. And so <clears throat> uh, I think what's lost on us is what changed during the exile. For us, you know, it's the next book, you know, we just re turn the page and then we continue with the storyline. It's like, oh yeah, these are the same people, they're the out, you know. But really everything radically changed for them, all of it. And part of that, um, during the, this radical change, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about what was lost, uh, what they lost. And so first, for starters, they lost their language. When the Hebrews came back, when the Israelites came back, most of them didn't even know how to speak Hebrew. They all spoke Aramaic. And that carried on through the years, even in Jesus' time, they were speaking Aramaic which is Babylonish. This is another name for the same language. So it's Babylon's language. So uh, most of what you see when you're reading scripture, uh, that was, we go back to the original Greek, because it's actually, it, it, we didn't lose anything, but most of the time they're speaking Aramaic in that setting. Uh, it was the common language for the Hebrews. They did, they, they, I mean, the Israelites, they definitely did speak Hebrew, most of them, they're learning it, but it's, it was not, even in Jesus' time, 500 years later, was still not the main language. It was still Aramaic. Um, so reading scripture was hard for them, because at that time, it could only be read in Hebrew. Um, another thing, of course, was lost was um, the temple, obviously. Um, all the gold and bronze articles were carried away, but more importantly, the sacrifice, sacrificial altar was gone, and that was the only place in the world that they could offer sacrifice to atone for sin. So no longer can they ever atone for their sins. Um, and uh, I just want to put a little note here for us to think about this, because there's, there's a crazy story happening here. Um, is nowhere in the Bible or in Babylon's listing of all the things, in their historical records of listings of things they carried away from the taking down of Jerusalem, was the Ark of the Covenant ever listed. And that would have been the hugest thing to carry away. So at this point, the Ark is lost. We don't know. It's still a mystery what happened to it. There's a lot of theories that Jeremiah hid it somewhere or you know, got carried down to Ethiopia and is still there today. Or Like, there's a lot of theories, right? But it's an important one because uh, the main thing that I want to talk about has to do with something about the ark. So what was most importantly lost at exile was the presence of God. So the very presence that led them through the desert 
rested on the ark behind the Holy of Holies the whole time. It was always there. The clouds, the cloud, the light, the fire, whatever the, the symbolism of God's physical presence, that's why they had the curtain up. People couldn't always see it. And now that's gone. And that is like the biggest thing for them. It was the most important thing. Uh, just to give you an example, Moses, which you would say is the father of Judaism, right? That, that's when the covenant started is with Moses. Moses didn't even want to go in the promised land if God's presence didn't come with him. That's how important it was. Um, and so I want to look at Exodus 33. Um, before I read this, though, uh, we have to think about what's happening in the chapter. The beginning of the chapter, uh, this is right after the, the uh, golden calf, right? And God's very angry. And so God's telling Moses, you know what? I made a promise to take you in the promised land to, for all this. So I'll arrange that all this, this is my version, by the way. I'll arrange all this, but I'll, I'm going to send an angel out before you to do it all. But my presence, I'm not going to go with you. And then this is Moses' response to God saying that. He said, then he said to him, if your presence doesn't go, does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how can we, how can it be known that I have found favor in your sight? And if your and I and your people, sorry, it is not if it it is not about your going with us, so that I and your people may be distinguished from all the other peoples who are on the face of the earth. So Moses was willing to give up his whole life story of leading the people to the promised land. He's willing to give up all that good stuff. He'd rather stay in the desert if God's presence is going to stay in the desert. He's not willing to go into all these great promises unless God's going with them. That's how important God's presence. And it, like it says here, it distinguished them differently from all the other peoples on the earth. That's what made them different is God's physical presence was always there in the temple. Um, <clears throat> so in this situation, of course, God's so pleased with Moses' response that that's when he said, you know what? Ask for anything. I'll give it to you. And Moses was like, well, I want to see your face. And he's like, well, you can't do that or you'll die. So I'll tell you what, you hide behind, you know, we know this story. It's a great story, but it's in response to Moses going, I'm willing to give it all up. All those good things that you're promising us, I'm willing to give it all up because I'd rather stay with your presence. So this is an important thing for the Jews. Um, it's also a good application for us. Are we willing to give up all the good things that we get from the Lord in order to get more of the Lord, right? Is it that important to us that we're like, you know what, Lord, I need this, I need this, I need this, but you know what, I'd rather have you. If, it, if I get those things, but I don't get you, you know, it, it, we really got to check our own hearts in this. Is the presence that important to us? Um, so before the temple's destroyed, Israel's confidence was in the temple, God's presence and the rituals around it, and not Scripture. It wasn't a big emphasis to look at Scripture. That was for the priests to look at, right? And how do we know this is because, I mean, we have a few examples. One is King Josiah's uh, revival, right? They're in the temple cleaning it, and they feel like, what is this? thing? And it's the Bible. They even totally forgot about it. It's the Torah. And they're like, hey, check this. You should show this to the king. You know, what is this thing? Right? Like they put it aside and didn't even emphasize reading it. It was not a big emphasis. Also in Isaiah 1, this is why Isaiah is like, I don't want your sacrifice. I'm going to put it in my words again, again. So bear with me. I was like, I don't want your sacrifices. What I want is your heart obedience. Like, you know, this is God's not looking for us to sacrifice things. He's looking us to pursue him and obey him right? Um, in Jeremiah 7, 3, 5, <clears throat> it says, Thus uh, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words. This is the uh, saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. 
Um, I don't necessarily read, need to read further. I just wanted to get to that phrase. It's said three times, and this is a, a Jewish way, writing of uh, an emphasis. It's like it's not like just repeating it as important. It's like a Geiger counter. Like it's more important, triple, double. Uh, I just went backwards. Double, triple. Okay, you get it. Like I, I'm not all there, but you know. So what the, what he's saying is, don't think that your security is the fact that the temple's there, right? Jeremiah's telling, warning them about the coming disaster if they continue in their disobedience. And their attitude was like, well, we have the only temple and God's presence here. God's never going to let anything bad happen to Jerusalem. This is our security. And, and God is telling them, uh, don't be deceived. Just because I do have my presence there doesn't mean I'm not going to do what I'm ask, or telling you through Jeremiah. And then, of course, uh, this is their attitude why they are better than all, not just distinctive of all the other nations, but they're better than all. Even in their worst state of like, yeah, we're not so great, but hey, we're better because we have God's presence. And we read that in Habakkuk, which I don't have that scripture, but basically God's telling Habakkuk that um, he's going to use Babylon to take down because of all of Israel's evil. And Habakkuk is confused. Like, what, you're going to use a more evil nation? to punish us for our evil? Like, it doesn't make sense. I mean, we have the temple. We're better than them in that sense, right? Um, but uh, these are just a few of the examples. We could see that Scripture was not the emphasis. The, the security was the fact that God's presence was in the temple. That was their security. So what changed? After they went into ag- exile, obviously, they don't have the temple anymore. They don't have that security. Um, And so the change is that they then turned into focusing on scripture and their story. That's the important thing that separates them from all other peoples. So a very huge emphasis on scripture and looking at scripture. In fact, it is what shaped scripture and the shift to scripture and focusing on culture to preserve culture is what shaped what we know as Judaism today. That's what they're still in that mode now, right? And it's all because of the exile, because they don't have a temple, right? So this is the beginning of, during this time, exile time, is the beginning of rabbinic teachings or the rabbi system that we know today started in exile. Um, the Talmud, the Midrash, these are different like teaching books of like how to read the scripture or how a Jew should live out what's taught in the scripture. Um, this all started during exile. Um, examining scripture and living correctly became the only way to get righteousness because no longer can you atone for sin with sacrifice. So then the emphasis was uh, examining scripture and living rightly. Um, and so I, during this time period, the scale, you know, the scale thing is like, oh, I have more good than bad. So that makes me a good person. That scale idea is what kind of birthed out of this time period. And now like, uh, a lot of different people kind of like wrongly think that, oh, if I do more good than bad, then I get to go to heaven. It's like, no. Um, uh, during this time, during, uh, actually during the book of Ezra, or shortly thereafter, um, uh, uh, this emphasis on scripture came. Ezra is is believed to put together the first canon of what's considered what we would call the Old Testament, but the the Hebrew Bible. He was the first one to like gather up all the prophets and Psalms instead of just the first five books, first uh, the Torah, but he also was gathering all these other things because there's an emphasis on the prophesied words of being God's word as well. So Ezra was the one that first put together a a collection of the books that were considered the Bible, as we call it. Um, And then during this time is when synagogues got started. There was no synagogues before exile. It's not mentioned in the Bible anywhere. Synagogues were communal, I'll call them churches, but a community-centered thing to preserve Jewish culture, even in another country. 
right? It's, it's not just studying the word. It's like it's everything. It, it's the place to go to get jobs, the place to go to talk to others about arranging marriages, or, you know, it's, it's about preserving Jewish culture and studying God's word. And that carries on until today, but it, before the, the fall of the temple, you've never seen a synagogue. I mean, there's nowhere in the Bible it says, thou shalt have synagogues in every neighborhood. Like, it was a concept to try to uh, preserve them from just becoming part of whatever people group they're in, right? It's about preserving their culture. So with that emphasis, um, they started looking at very closely, and we see it in some books like Daniel, which I'll mention, um, but they started looking at prophecies um, of the prophets, the, the near prophets, like the ones that were prophesying that they're going to go into exile. And now that it happens, like, whoa, let's look through this and study through it, right? And compare it. Um, like Isaiah and Jeremiah that were talking about the coming of this exile. And then also the prophets that were happening during exile became very much elevated and included in this like emphasis of studying became a huge focus. So it, like in Daniel 9.2, you see him, he's reading Jeremiah in Daniel 9.2. He's studying the, the, I mean, they, their lives crossed over. Imagine someone wrote something and you're like, oh, I'm reading Holy Scripture. So I thank you for handing me Holy Scripture. Like, you know, their lives crossed over and uh, everybody recognized it right away because so many prophecies already start, start being fulfilled. And that's where he sees that in Jeremiah, the, this punishment is only supposed to last 70 years. Um, so with looking at the prophets and studying scripture, what we would call scripture, um, there became a growing concern for going back and doing things the right way, right? There's this emphasis in Daniel 9 that talks about also about the rebuilding of the temple. When, when the the it actually literally says when the temple is decreed to be built, uh, he gives a time period, which, do I talk about that? I don't know, of when the Messiah is supposed to show up. We'll talk about the Messiah in a second. But they want to get back to build the temple because they want to get God's approval back. And more importantly, they want to get God's presence back, the thing that makes them different than all the other people's. And of course, they want to start the atonement of sins again, like being able to sacrifice animals. Another thing that changed, which we, we kind of take for granted, is with this new emphasis on Scripture, the idea of the Messiah actually started changing into the Messiah. Before exile, the Messiah, there's many Messiah. Messiah just means anointed of God, like God-chosen leader. And so... Uh, before the exile, there's, uh, it was just a human leader. And so Moses was a Messiah. Joshua was a, a Messiah. And King David was seen as a Messiah. There, anyone that's God's picked and anointed to be their leader that rescues or brings about God's will for the people. So Messiah is just a title that anybody could have. Um, it's just, I mean, not just anybody. You know what I mean? Like, it was not seen as the Messiah. But I also want to point out, actually, I do have this next scripture. I want to point out that even God calls King Cyrus, a Persian, Medo-Persian king, a Messiah. Let's look at uh, Isaiah 45, 1. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed one. By the way, this is written 150 years before he even existed, which is crazy. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Lord says to Cyrus, his anointed, that word anointed is Mashiach. It's like God saying, Cyrus is my Messiah for the Jewish people, right? Whom I have taken by my right hand to subdue the nations before him and to loose the loins of the kings and to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. So this is part of the reason why Cyrus had um, such favor in God's eyes, or he sees that God had favor on him, and that he was the one that's supposed to release the Jews after the 70 years of punishment. So he was there to um, decree, which when we start the book of Ezra, we'll see that. 
decree that they build a temple to this God, the same one that handpicked them. Um, so during this time period, Daniel, Ezekiel, and Zechariah uh, started bringing a clear understanding of the Messiah that we consider today, um, that it's more apocalyptic. It's more of a, 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 a special person for this like end times or entering into the kingdom of God. Um, of course, in Daniel, in chapter 7, I don't have that scripture, don't be looking for it, but uh, Daniel chapter 7 uh, is where we get introduced to the Son of Man. And the Son of Man is a mystifying character because the Son of Man is raised up on clouds in that chapter. Only God gets that. And then is worshipped by the angels with God. And, like no humans are supposed to get worshipped, right? Like, and so even when Jesus is time, that's his favorite phrase to use, that he's the son of man. Um, there's a few times in John where like, who is the son of man? Like they're confused because no humans are supposed to get worshiped alongside God. So who's this son of man, right? But along with that, there's all these other uh, prophecies um, about a special Messiah, like the Messiah, like we're, we're used to that. But before exile, that was not, that was not the thinking at all. Um, in chapter 9 of Daniel, also he talks about, again, you have to do some study on it because it actually uses the term weeks, but it's worked out prophetically to about 490 years after the decree of the temple that he, this special Messiah, will arrive. Um, again, that's very new news for them. Like, oh, um, but again, even in this, they were looking for a human Messiah, right? That's what they're used to, a, a handpicked person by God. Um, also, in uh, Daniel 7, he's supposed to live forever. So that's why, as one of the questions of Jesus, when he says he's going to be raised up, someone's like, son of man is supposed to live forever. Who's the son of man? Like, tell us what's going on here. Like, you can't say you're the son of man and you're going to die on a cross. Like, you know, what is going on? Anyways, uh, <clears throat> but they're looking to have God's presence back and that Messiah will bring in the kingdom of God on earth, namely the kingdom of Israel, um, because that's what they knew ahead of, before time. That's what the kingdom of Israel was supposed to be, God's kingdom here on earth, right? And Christendom kind of took that and went further with it and trying to make, after the Holy Roman Empire, there was this attempt to make God's kingdom here on earth. <clears throat> so, that's the big picture, but I want to go a little bit bigger. And I want to talk about God's view on all this, right? Because uh, it's more than our human understanding. I mean, for us, it's going to be easy because we have 2020 hindsight, right? But, Ezra and Nehemiah, um, we, have to, we have to take a big picture of what's really happening. Like I said, there's three stories and there's three downers in each story, right? There's kind of a, a, a bummer that kind of happens, right? But what they're taking, God had taken away his presence from Israel because of their disobedience. So now um, the punishment is complete and they're, it, they're desperate for God to bring his presence back. So they're taking this new uh, approach of like, we're going to do everything right so that God will bring his presence back, right? But they're also, they have an uphill battle here because they don't have the ark. They don't know where the ark is. And that's where God's presence is supposed to sit, is on the mercy seat on the ark, right? So they just want to show God that they're going to be do everything right so that he'll bring his presence back. So they thought, oh, building the temple. Again, I'm, I'm doing an overview right now. We'll eventually get into the book. Uh, they thought be, building the temple and God will bring his presence back, but that didn't happen. That's what we're going to hopefully look at today if I ever stop talking. <clears throat> and then they thought, oh, you know what? Ezra could show us, let's do everything exactly right according to the law, and then maybe God will bring his presence back. 
and it didn't happen. And then Nehemiah came along and was like, well, you know, as long as the temple's there and evil can come at any time, we need that wall to protect so that we keep the infidels, the, the evil people out of the city of God's holy city. And, and maybe that will bring God's presence back. And that didn't happen either. They were never able in human external effort to make God's presence come back. Because in God's way, he had a different thing in mind. God was going to bring his presence back, but to their unknowingness, it was going to be in the human person of Jesus Christ. Jesus went into the temple and fulfilled his presence being back, finally. And of course, it took 490 years, and for us, that's, that seems like a long time. But God... <laughs> God's a thousand years is one day to God and one day is a thousand years, right? Time is, is his timing. Like imagine living in that whole time period and having living your whole life of being confused. Like why didn't God's presence come back, right? You know, not knowing. That's why we need to look at history and look forward with God's eyes so we could try to get his picture of what he's doing. So on Passion Week, um, which is another passion. Hey, that's a passion. Uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, I love studying Passion Week, is that what I meant to say? Uh, Jesus occupied the temple for two to three days, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, just like the Messiah is supposed to. I mean, in Mark, it says they couldn't even buy or sell because he did so dominated with all the crowds. He dominated the temple. He, God's presence was finally there, doing what God's presence is supposed to do. Um, Again, they weren't looking for a human God, Messiah, right? And of course, the nation as a whole, not all of them, missed it, the infilling of God's presence. They missed it. They didn't even understand what was happening when Jesus was there, of course. But then he was also rejected, which is crazy for us in hindsight looking at it. But... Um, <clears throat> The other thing that Jesus revealed to us is the new idea of God's temple. For starters, Jesus calls himself the temple. In John 2, 19 through 22, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said to him, it took 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it up in three days. But he, he was speaking of the temple of his body that when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Jesus was showing them there's a new temple in this new covenant. Um, <clears throat> and that not just Jesus was the temple, but he was the cornerstone. So the cornerstone, uh, I love the idea of the cornerstone. It's kind of lost on us. But basically, it's the biggest first stone that's put down. And it has to be so precise because everything is measured from it. So if it's crooked, the whole building is going to be crooked, right? By the time you get to the second floor, I don't know, you know. So he's the perfect stone on which all of us are built off of. And in Peter, 1 Peter 2 through 4, it says, and coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is the choice and precious in God's sight or in the sight of God. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we're now the stones in the temple in God's way of seeing it. I'm just a rock. Actually, Peter means a rock, by the way. I don't know. Anyways, uh, we're just rocks and we're being built as a, the new temple of the new covenant of the presence of God. And now that's why the presence of God dwells in us, not in some building in Jerusalem. It's because what Jesus did and God revamped the whole thing to make it about humans and not about a physical holy place. And then lastly, uh, God says that the old way or the old temple, the old idea is, is obsolete. It's pointless. Um, in Hebrews 8.13, he says, 
When he said a new covenant, he had made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Again, when Hebrews was written, the temple had not been destroyed in 70 AD yet. So it's still there. That's why he's saying it's growing old, it's going to disappear. And then he also, uh, he wants to warn us that we, if we keep the old way of thinking, we're going to miss out. In Hebrews 9, 8 through 9, it says, The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. According, accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. So that phrase, while the outer tabernacle is still standing, actually the Greek phrase can be, it can be turned around, and it's actually while they're still standing in the tabernacle. And what he's saying is like, if you're still trying to do righteousness the old way, you're missing out. There's no way into the holy place. You have to do it through the Holy Spirit. And you have to give up this idea that in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, that they had, if we do external things, then we get God's presence. And he's saying uh, in the scripture that, no, if we still think that way, we're going to miss God's presence. We have to go into the holy through God. If we're still standing in the tabernacle trying to do the right things for God to get something from God, we're missing the point. We're going to miss it. So, yeah, I'm almost done. And then we can start reading the book. Okay, so even with this good understanding of God's words and plans, many times we still kind of miss what God is doing, even for us today. Uh, remember, his thoughts and his ways are higher than ours, you know, those two scriptures. Um, so um, we, even when we knew God's presence is to occupy the temple of God, but we had no idea that he himself would come as a human. I'm, I, I'm putting us in the same category as the Jews because I guarantee if we lived at the time, we would be stumped as well, right? I, I don't want to ever singular out a certain people group and say, oh, they missed the point. It's like, if I was there, I would have been one of them, right? So even when they knew uh, the presence of God would come to the temple eventually, they weren't thinking a human would. Um, and be rejected by them. Uh, I think a great example for this is um, the 12th apostle. So G Jesus chose 12 apostles for a very specific reason, and it's amazing. And then Judas, you know, he, he betrayed Jesus, and he's out. So now they're down to 11, and they have this understanding. It's like, oh, we're supposed to have 12, right? And so... The whole idea of, of them drawing straws, well, drawing lots, but basically drawing straws to see who they should pick to be the 12th apostle is kind of ridiculous. They're kind of missing the point because now that we have hindsight and looking back, who do you think God's preference of who he picked for the 12th apostle? Paul. Paul should have been the 12th apostle because they weren't willing to wait. They thought, oh, we got to fill this slot and get the 12 in there. We got to have 12, right? And so if they just waited a little bit, maybe 10 years, it would be obvious like, oh, Paul is who God's picking to be the 12th apostle, right? So even after Jesus, when we have certain good understandings, we'll still miss it. We'll still miss it because we're, his ways are higher than ours, right? So the question is, were the efforts of Zerubbabel, which we'll, if you don't know him, we'll find out about him in, here in a minute, Ezra and Nehemiah, were their efforts in vain? I mean, I would obviously say no, because two things, there's very much God's will was with them. We're going to see some miracles that happen, that God is doing this, right? God is allowing this to happen. Um, God was with them, so it's obvious this is very important, but... I think the big picture that we need to know is that the temple had to be present for Jesus to come because the Messiah, Son of Man, is supposed to occupy the temple. It's the place of God's presence. 
And I would even argue for us today that the temple is supposed to be there before Jesus' second coming. So I'm, I'm very torn up. Like, I don't have a temple. We don't need sacrifice. It's like, but Jesus would come if there's a temple. Well, then build it, right? You know, I'm like, I want to see Jesus come back, right? So, um, yeah, the temple in this plan, the temple had to be in place for when Jesus came the first time because all the prophecies pointed and mentioned of the second temple about his coming. Okay, so to play a little, oh my gosh. So, uh, to play a little catch up, I'm going to actually have Ethan come up. He just finished a nine-month Bible course where he charted and studied all the books of the Bible. And um, actually, can you just read from the beginning? I mean, I, I would talk about the first four chap uh, verses, but you know what? Let's just read it. Can you read all three chapters? He's going to read three chapters, and we're going to like get right up to chapter four. Just start from verse one and go on. And just those two pauses, you know. It'd be a lot of names that probably don't come out how they're actually pronounced. Because uh, I would stumble through those names trying to pronounce them, and like, hey, he just studied the Bible. Let him do it. You know? He actually just wants to laugh at me. All right. Ezra 1.1. 1, 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he, he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you, of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Can I pause you there? Thing? <laughs> Sorry. I just want to point out, it's believed that Daniel approached Cyrus and pointed out scripture where God's actually had his name already pre-written. Like, what a mind blower. It's like, whoa, crap. You know, what? am I going to disobey this? It's like it was pre-written 150 years. I said crap. Sorry. Yeah. Anyways, go ahead. Sorry. Every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, and goods and cattle together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the father's households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose, and everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. All those about them encouraged them with articles of silver, with gold, with goods, with cattle, and with valuables, aside from all that was given as a free will offering. Also, King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had given away from, had carried away from Jerusalem and put in the house of his gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought out by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, as he counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. Now this was their number, 30 gold dishes, a thousand, thousand silver dishes, 29 duplicates, 30 gold bowls, 410 silver bowls of a second kind, and a thousand other articles. All the articles of gold and silver numbered 5,400. Bazar brought them all up with the exiles who went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. Now those are the people of the province who came up out of captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away to Babylon, and returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his city. These came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Reeliah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Bigvi, Rehum, and Bana. The number of the men of the people of Israel, the sons of Parash, 2,172. The sons of Shephatiah, 372. The sons of Arah, 775. The sons of Pahath Moab, of the sons of Jeshua and Joab, 2,812. The sons of Elam, 1,254. The sons of Zatu, 945. The sons of Zakai, 760. The sons of Bani, 642. The sons of Babai, 623. The sons of Asgad, 1,222. The sons of Adonikam, 666. The sons of Bigvi, 2054. The sons of Adin, 454. The sons of Otter of Hezekiah, 98. The sons of Bezai, 323.
the sons of Jorah, 112, the sons of Hashum, 223, the sons of Gebar, 95, the men of Bethlehem, 123, the men of Netopapha, 56, the men of Anathoth, 128, the sons of Azmatheth, 42, the sons of kiriath Urim, Kephira, and Beerah, 743, the sons of Ramah and Geba, 621, the men of Mikmas, 122, the men of Bethel and Ai, 223, the sons of Nebo, 52, the sons of Magbish, 156, the sons of the other Elam, 1,254, the sons of Harim, 320, the sons of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 725, the men of Jericho, 345, the sons of Sena, 3,630, the priests, the sons of Jediah of the house of Jeshua, 973. The sons of Emer, 1,052. <coughs> the sons of Pashur, 1,247. The sons of Harim, 1,017. The Levites, the sons of Jeshua and Kadmiel of the sons of Hodaviah, 74. The singers, the sons of Asaph, 128. The sons of the gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Ater, the sons of Talman, the sons of Akub, the sons of Hatisa the sons of Shobai, in all, 139. The temple servants, the sons of Ziha, the sons of Hasufa, the sons of Tabah, the sons of Keros, the sons of Sia, the sons of Padan, the sons of Lebanon, the sons of Hagwa, the sons of Akub, the sons of Hagwa, the sons of Shalmai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Gidel, the sons of Gahar, the sons of Raya, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nakoda, the sons of Gazam, the sons of Uzzah, the sons of Pasea, the sons of Besai, the sons of Asna, the sons of Mayanim, the sons of Nephizim, the sons of Bakubuk, the sons of Hakufa, the sons of Harthur, the sons of Bosluth, the sons of Mehira, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkos, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tema, the sons of Naziah, the sons of Hadifa, the sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Sotai, the sons of Hasaphareth, the sons of Peruda the sons of Jala, the sons of Darkon, the sons of Gidel, the sons of Shephathiah, the sons of Hatil, the sons of Pokereth Hazabim, the sons of Ami, all the temple servants and the sons of Solomon's servants were 392. Now these are those who came up from Tel Malah, Tel Harsha, Herub, Adon, and Emer. But they were not able to give evidence of their father's households and their descendants, whether they were of Israel. The sons of Deliah, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 652. Of the sons of the priests, the sons of Habiah, the sons of Hakaz, the sons of Barzillai, who took a wife from the daughters of Barzillai the Gileadite, and he was called by their name. These searched among their ancestral registration, but they could not be located. Therefore, they were considered unclean and excluded from the priesthood. The governor said to them that they should not eat from the most holy things until a priest stood up with Urim and Thummim. The whole assembly numbered 42,360, besides their male and female servants, who numbered 7,337, and they had 200 singing men and women. Their horses were 736, their mules 245, their camels 435, their donkeys 6,720. Some of the heads of the father's households, when they arrived at the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, offered willingly for the house of God to restore it on its foundation. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury for the work 61,000 gold drachmas and 5,000 silver minas and a hundred priestly garments. Now the priests and the Levites, some of the people, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants, lived in their cities and all Israel in their cities. Now when the seventh month came and the sons of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Then Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brothers, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brothers arose and built the altar of God, altar of the God of Israel, to offer burnt offerings on it. I just want to comment right there. The, before the temple's even built, they started sacrificing on the altar. They're, uh, well, it's about to say it, but they're very desperate to start this sacrifice and get God's favor because they're very afraid of the people around. I'm sorry. Go ahead. To offer burnt offerings on it. As it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So they set up the altar on its foundation, for they were terrified because of the people of the lands. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. They celebrated the Feast of Booths, as it is written, and offered the fixed number of burnt offerings daily, according to the ordinance, as each day required. And afterward, there was a continual burnt offering 
also for the new moons and for all the fixed festivals of the Lord that were consecrated, and from everyone who offered a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. And they gave money to the masons and carpenters and food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians, and brought cedar wood from Lebanon to the Sea of at Joppa, according to the permission they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Now in the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josadak, and the rest of the brothers, the priests and the Levites, and all who came from the captivity to Jerusalem, began the work appointed the Levites from twenty years and older to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Then Joshua with his sons and brothers stood united with Kadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah and the sons of Henadad, with their sons and brothers, the Levites, to oversee the workmen in the temple of God. Now when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord. According to the direction of King David of Israel, they sang, praising, and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because of the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Yet many of the priests and the Levites and heads of the father's households, the old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice, for the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, while many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the shout of joy from the sound of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard far away. Thank you, Ethan. So, um, just to mention again what the scripture just said, because is that the old men remembered Solomon's temple, and so what was being built was kind of meager and pitiful compared to that, right? <clears throat> and so even though the young people that, the younger people that don't remember the old temple is going, hey, we're going to get God's presence back. This is the first step, you know, getting it back. Yet the older ones are like, oh, we had such a better temple back then. It was much more honoring of God's greatness, you know. And that's why we also see in Jesus' day, King Herod the Great revamped the temple so much that it's even uh, said to have been bigger than, than Solomon's temple. The temple mount that is there today was bigger than Solomon's um, because he wanted to revamp it. But again, Herod the Great had other motives. It was a big money-making scheme, but... In verse, uh, in chapter four, I, I was hoping to get to the bottom of this chapter, so please bear with me. I'll try to read. Ethan reads so fast, and I loved it, uh, but I don't read that. So I'll try to read. But now, uh, in verse one, now when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building the temple of the Lord of Lord of God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's households and said to them, let us build with you for we like you seek your God and we have been sacrificing to him since the days of Eshuridun, did I say that right? I don't know. King of Assyria who brought us up here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers of the households of Israel said to them, you have nothing in common with us in building our, a house to our God, we ourselves will together build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. So these people that were there, these are what we now call the Samaritans. They were part of the northern kingdom that Assyria had toppled a long time ago. And they were, uh, uh, Assyria brought, deported a lot of people and brought a lot of people over. And so they're considered half-breeds. And they took on, uh, I've talked about this before, the northern kingdom chose Mount um, Gerizim, Gerizim, I think, called, uh, as the place of sacrifice, which Moses did command that, right, in Deuteronomy. Um, but that was when they first entered the land, and then later God chose Jerusalem to be the place of his temple. And so they, when they separated from Judah and, and Benjamin, they chose to continue mixing other religions and Judaism together um, to suit their needs. And again, that's where Jesus met the woman at the well. She was a Samaritan. And remember her questions like, oh, you Jews say we have to worship in, in Jerusalem and we worship here on the mountaintop, you know. And 
Jesus is, again, he's revamping it. It's like it's not about there or here. And yeah. Anyways, so these Samaritans, they want to, the Jews are going to do it right this time. So we don't want to mix religions. That was our, our issue before why God was so angry with us. We're going to do it right this time because we're going to do everything right to get his presence back. Uh, verse 4, it says, Then the people of the land discouraged when they couldn't join them to take over and to water down what their efforts were. They discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel all the days of King Cyrus, or Cyrus the king of Persia, until even until the region, uh, the reign, sorry, of Darius, king of Persia. So the I think for us, a good application is when we're moving in obedience with God, we have to expect opposition, right? When we're going to obey God, there's going to be opposition. And sometimes that opposition is our own selfish heart, but a lot of times it's not. And that doesn't mean we stop, which we'll talk about that later. In verse 7, it says, In the days of Artaxerxes, built a Bishlam, Midrasa, save me. I don't know, to Beal and the rest of his colleagues who wrote to Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. And, and the text of the letter was written in Aramaic and translated from Aramaic. Rehum, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, wrote the letter against Jerusalem to King Artaxerxes as follows. Then he wrote um, Rehum, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, and the, the rest of their colleagues, and the judges, and the lesser governors, and the officials, and the secretaries, and the men of Erech, and the Babylonians, and the men of Susa, that is, the Elamites, and the rest of the nations, which the great and honorable Anasapar deported and settled in the city of Samaria, and the rest of the region beyond the river now. So they're starting this accusation like all of us think this, right? It's like, it can't be just one, per, one group's emphasis, the Samaritans. They're trying to include everybody to try to convince the king to see it their way, which is always a good thing to think about when you start hearing accusations, when people use like we or us in their accusations, start asking them like, what do you think? Quit throwing everybody else to try to make your argument bigger. Um, it's, it's always uh, them trying to make a bigger uh, fairness facts, if you will. And verse 11 says, this is the copy which was, which the letter of the letter, which they sent to him King to King Artaxerxes, your servant, the men of the region beyond the river. That's the Jordan river, by the way. And now let it be known to the King that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are rebuilding the rebellious and evil city and are finishing the walls and repairing the foundations. Now let it be known to the king that if the city is rebuilt and the walls are finished, they will not pay tribute, custom, or toll, and it will be damaged, it will damage the revenue of the kings. Now, because we are in the service of the palace, we are so loyal, uh, it is not fitting for us to see the king king's dishonor. Therefore, let us uh, therefore we have sent and inform, inform the king. So what they're saying actually is not all that wrong in the past. In fact, he's going to look it up and see, yes, they again, again, will rebel against other um, leaders. But again, they're approaching it like, hey, we're just looking out for your honor, but really it's what they want, right? It's what they want. In verse 15, it says, so that a search may be made in the record books of your fathers, and you will discover that in the record books and learn that the city is a rebellious city and damaging to the kings and the provinces, and that they will have incite, they have incited revolt within the past days. Therefore, that city was laid waste. We inform the king that if the city is built, rebuilt, and the walls finished, as a result, you will have no possession in the province beyond the river. So again, they're saying, check it out. Check out the past. Um, they're going to, if they get strong, they're going to kick you out as king. And you're going to have no possession over there. And uh, yeah, this is true because I don't know if we're aware of this, but Babylon laid siege to Jerusalem three times. The first time they surrendered. 
The second time they sacked Jerusalem but left another king in place. They took that rightful king back to Jerusalem. They took some exiles. And then 20 years later, they rebelled again. And that time they was like, well, we're just going to destroy the whole place because it keeps rebelling over and over and over, right? So they're not all that wrong, right? But they're trying to get them out of disfavor with the king. So they look it up, right? And then the king in verse 17, then the king sent an answer to Rehum, the commander and Shimshai, the scribe, and the, the rest of the, their colleagues who lived in Samaria and the rest of the provinces beyond the river, peace. And now the document which you sent to us has been translated and read before me. A decree had been issued by me and a search had been made and it has been discovered that the city has risen up against the kings in the past days and rebellion and revolt had been per perpetrated in it. That mighty kings have ruled over Jerusalem, governing all the provinces beyond the river, and that tribute and custom were to and toll were paid to them. Not me, right? To them. So he found the records, and of course, what they're saying is true. <clears throat> I do want to point out something that, uh, for time's sake, I didn't stop, Ethan, but um, Cyrus made a decree in, in, in Persian, in Babylonian, Middle let's say, you know, the Fertile Crescent, the kings of there. Whenever a decree is made, it cannot be undone. It cannot be undone. And a great example is when uh, Xerxes uh, gets rid of Vashti. Later on, he was like, well, I can't bring her back now. So we're going to have to, I can't undo. Since he says there's a decree, it's like from God himself, and it can never be undone. So we're going to see what this king does um, because he's going to see the decree that was given that they should build the temple. Okay, so in uh, verse 21 and 22, so, so now a decree to make the, these men stop work, that this city may not be rebuilt until a decree is issued by me. Beware of being negligent and carrying out this matter. Why should a damage increase to the detriment of the king? So instead, he can't undo the other decree, so he puts basically a stop work order, right? Which means a halt. And it's a, de a new decree that he can't undo the old one, a new decree that it's at halt until he says they could start up again. Not saying they can't ever do it, right? It's saying it's on hold. Uh, verse 23, as soon as the copy of King Artaxerxes, the document was read before Rehum and Shimshai, the scribe and their colleagues. They went in haste to Jerusalem to the Jews and stopped them by force of arms. Then the work on the house of God in Jerusalem ceased and was stopped until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So the very thing that the Jews were afraid of while they started the sacrifices right away, they were afraid of the people because the surrounding peoples because they had more force. And now they have the king's favor, and so they did exactly what they're afraid of, force of arms, force them to stop. Um, <clears throat> and that's something for us to keep in mind. When we're extremely afraid of something, the enemy loves to use that to intimidate us and put us in our place. Uh, and that's why we need to keep, take everything to the Lord. So they stopped, and it says until the... The second year of the reign of King Darius, how long would you guess that would be? Because, you know, we're not looking at the records. We have no idea. 16 years. They stopped the building of the temple for 16 years. I don't know about you, but if something's delayed for two years, I feel like it's never going to happen, right? It's like, forget it. This is never going to happen, trying to get, you know, a permit changed or something like that, right? Um, but in this case, in God's people's case, it was 16 years. And it did seem like forever because we'll later see when we um, move forward because we're going to wrap things up now. But we will see that they so much started just forgetting about the temple that Haggai and uh, Zechariah had to start prophesying, like, you're just focusing on your own house. What about the temple of God, right? I started had to be pressure, prophesying, pressuring them into back to thinking, like, 
well, we should get back to this at some point, right? Um, <clears throat> so we're going to end there with uh, this bit of a downer of it being stopped. Um, but I just want us to keep in mind, like, God is still faithful to his words. Maybe 16 years is longer than most humans want to wait. But for God, it's nothing. And when God gives his word, he's going he's gonna to make it happen. Maybe it's not in the timing we want, but our hope is in him, not in everything we get right now in our life. And uh, I like how Hebrews puts it. Like there's all these heroes of the faith. Many of them never even got to see all the promises that God made. We get to enjoy it because it came, we came after the promises were fulfilled. But they, they still had their hope in God that they lived a life of faith, right? And so just to encourage us that we're going to wrap it up right now, but that in this like 16-year delay, God still does things. So maybe in your life you have delays. Me and my family, we were this close to a, going over to China to get our son, and then COVID hit, and we're still waiting. We're coming up on four years now, and we've lost all hope. <laughs> like, we're not sure they'll ever start uh, in our category again. But God didn't lose hope. So we're trying to put our f hope in God. Maybe his plan is different. I don't know. But uh, whatever God's taking you in, don't lose hope. Keep your hope in him. Because his timing, when he says stuff, when he's wanting to do stuff, it'll happen. Even if it seems like it's 16 years. Let me pray for us, and we'll, we'll stop there, and we'll continue in another speed reading next week. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this time and being able to uh, just examine the words that you have put down for us. I mean, there's so much we could draw from, but even just the story itself is just amazing. If we step back and like try to uh, take it in as a big picture, Father, that everything is pointing to you, Lord Jesus. And in, even in these stories, it's always going to be pointing to you. And so, Father, I, I pray, Father, that whatever you have spoken in the individual's heart, I know what you've spoken in my heart, that I wouldn't lose, lose that, that I would be able to dwell on it, ponder it, and apply it to the life and the faith that I have in you. And so, Father, I pray that even as we're going home in this time, that you give us safe, and then we're laying in bed, a safe travel, and laying in bed that we wouldn't just drift off it. We'd take those moments of before falling asleep just to turn our focus one more time to you and what you might have said tonight. And Lord Jesus, uh, thank you so much for being faithful. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Thanks, Ethan. <laughs>